Hey, what's going on, everybody? Nathan Holmes here, Senior Minister of Hamilton Mill Christian Church. I am so blessed and excited that you're online checking out some of the content that we've made available to you. And I hope that it's a blessing to you and helps you to grow in your walk with Christ. Just know that this content is only meant to supplement your growth and not replace your involvement in a strong Bible-based church. It's one thing to watch church online, but it's a whole other thing to be a part of a life-giving church that's on the front lines of doing ministry in the lives of the community and its people. So I'd love for you to come out and join us one Sunday and be a part of what we're doing here at Hamilton Mill Christian Church because I believe that God is doing something great in the lives of the people that are here week in and week out. So thanks and have a great one. Hey, I know it's Father's Day, so this is always really fun to do. So men, I want you to uh, reach back really quick, grab your wallet if you would, uh, because this is always a fun little thing to do. You know, men, we always have the biggest wallets. Most of us, you know, we, we've got these giant wads that we carry around that make us sit lopsided and everything. So here's what I'm going to do. Men, if you think you've got the fattest wallet in the room, I want you to come on up here and we're going to see who's got the thickest wallet uh, in this room right now. So men, go ahead, check your, check your wallet, check your wallet. If you want to come on up, come on up. Let's see what you got. We're going to put it up against the, uh, the ruler here. Come on, Ray, I see you checking. Hey, you never know. Come on up. Who's got, who's got it? Here we go. Reach back. I'm not going to take your wallet. I'm not taking any of your money. I'm just, I just want to see how thick your wallet is. Let's go. All right, James, let's see what you got. I promise you'll get it back with the money in it. So let's see. Let's see. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty thick. Dude, your chiropractor probably isn't. Uh... All right, you're like, uh... oh, let me get this way here. You're like an inch and a quarter there. So hold on. Let's see what. Hold on. You remember yours. Come on now. Come on. Let's see. Oh, that's a little, that's a little bit. That's an inch and three-eighths. Hold on, Bob. Oh, let's see what Bob's got. Oh, I think he's got the big one. Look at that. There we go. <laughs> oh, yeah, Bob's got this. Here we go. Yeah, inch and three-quarters. Anybody can beat that, you think? Come on, man. Somebody, somebody in the room? Nobody? You're going to let, the, you're gonna let Bob get it? Oh, Steven's outside. All right, we'll make some take it out. All right, so we're going to let Bob take the, uh, take the prize. Here you go, Bob. Here you go. Happy Father's Day. It's a little something to say. Happy Father's Day. Another card to make the wallet bigger. <laughs> hey, I am so glad you guys are here. Um, it has been an incredible morning. It's such a blessing. I'm so thankful to be with you to be able to wrap up this series. That's not why I'm thankful. I'm just thankful you're here for the wrap-up of the series. Let's get that in the right order. But I'm so thankful that you're here. We have been tracking through this whole entire process of understanding this idea of staycation. And I, as I said before, I promise you that this uh, series had been selected prior to all of the COVID craziness. Uh, last July, when I took my, my planning break to plan out the sermon series for the year, um, this just seemed to fit right here in this uh, May-June slot, and that's where it went. Little did I know back then, but God knew, of course, that this would be a perfectly titled message series for what we're going through. But the whole idea is really just looking at um, how we can be used by God right where we're at. That we don't have to have any special, special privileges or a plane ticket or a passport to be able to do God's work, but there is work to be done right here in our backyard. And it is our responsibility, our privilege as individuals in the kingdom of God to be able to do that work. And so I am just thankful to be able to kind of land this plane today and, and finish this up uh, and wrap this up for us this morning. And uh, if you've got a Bible, I want you to go ahead and turn. We're going to be in 2 Kings and in Revelation, kind of on two ends of the Bible. But you can go ahead and hold those in ready as we get through this morning. They'll be on the screens, of course, and uh, we'll be reading God's Word that way. So I'm going to pray for us this morning in just a moment. But before we do, my whole hope this morning is, is how can the end, I want to answer this question, how can the end um, cause a sense of urgency for us. As Christ followers, you and I tracking with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, how can the knowledge of the end times, the, the end as it's, as it's quoted in Revelation, how can that motivate us and cause a sense of urgency to well up inside of us? That's what I want to, so for us to look at today. So we're going to pray and then we're going to get right into that. Father, we thank you again for this morning. We thank you for the privilege and the, the honor and blessing it is to gather in your house once again. Father, I just pray right now as we um, just settle our minds around your word, as we yield our hearts to you, Father, and as we intersect with your Holy Spirit, God, I just pray that you would do a mighty work in us today. Father, all around this room, those watching online, uh, anybody within the sound of my voice, Father, if, if they could just walk away from today knowing that you have had a message for them, a word straight to them, straight to me, Father. Father, help us this morning to give our time to you and focus our minds' attention on what it is you're trying to communicate to us today. 
It's your son's name we pray. Amen. How many of you guys have ever missed something important? Like, like really important. Not like, you know, like you, you missed a, a, a bill deadline or anything. Those aren't important. But like something really important. Like we're going to do some, some show of hands here. So I need you all to participate. I'm going to just name out some things that you might have missed over in your lifetime. And you just keep your hand raised if you've missed any of these, okay? How about you've missed like a really important phone call? Like a phone call you were waiting from either a doctor or something or a loved one, but you missed that phone call. That's real easy. That, that's probably a lot of us maybe, but you've missed an important phone call. Uh, what about an important visit? Maybe somebody uh, just swung by your house, uh, um, you know, and just said, hey, <clears throat> you know, I, I was going to stop by your house and sorry I missed you. Anybody miss somebody just important visiting by? All right, what about a ride? Anybody ever miss like a, an Uber or, a, or something like that or a Lyft ride where you called for one and, and they showed up and they get, waited for their five minutes and then they left you and then you got charged? Anybody ever happen? Uh, what about a train? Anybody ever missed a MARTA train? Like you're running up to MARTA or, or something like that and you're getting there right as it's leaving and you have to wait five more minutes for the next one? Yeah, some of us have. Um, what about a flight? Anybody ever missed a flight before? Those, that's the worst when you miss a flight. Yeah, okay, the pilot is raising your hand. That's concerning me right now. So um, <laughs> let's hope it wasn't that one. Um, what about a missed opportunity? That's always good. Uh, maybe some idea or, or some crazy thing that you had thought of and you missed that opportunity because you didn't act on it. Yeah, we've missed a lot of things in life. Uh, when I was younger, I was on a mission trip uh, in, in England. And uh, part of this time, at the end of my trip, uh, I was supposed to join my host family down at the coast uh, for like my, the last like week and a half or so of my trip. I was going to be down there with them. And so I was coming off of this mission, and I was going to stay at his house. They were already left to go to the coast, and I was at his house by myself. And the instructions were very simple. Nathan, you just need to go down to the bus stop and catch this number bus to get you to this train station to get you down to the coast. Super simple. You can't mess that up until I get involved. And then it gets messed up really easily because apparently the number that I was supposed to catch has a different schedule on the weekends than it does during the week. So during the week, it was at 9.30. On the weekends, it was at 9. So I show up to this bus stop by myself in a foreign country, mind you. Luckily, it was at the end, so I was a little more familiar with the area. But I show up at the bus stop. I thought five minutes early, but I was actually 25 minutes late. And I missed the bus to get me to the train station to get me down to the coast. So then I start doing the math. Okay, they're in uh, kilometers, and it's, it's eight kilometers to the next train station. So how do I? So I just walk. I had my backpack. I had everything. I just had to just start walking it. And uh, I, I made it to the train, luckily, and got it down to the coast. But that one little mess up, that one little miscalculation of the schedule uh, cost me, uh, what is that, four miles, I guess? Eight kilometers? Yeah, I don't know. Do the math. It's like it was four miles. But anyways, missed the bus. Missed my opportunity, missed, almost missed the train. This morning, I want to talk about what happens at the end. What happens when we get to the end of the world? Uh, if you want to talk about some doom and gloom, we're not living in that time, I hope, right now. Um, as far as immediate future, I do believe we're living in the end times. But uh, let's hope we have a little bit more time to be able to do God's work. But this morning, if you could just follow along, if you're following along with me, this is kind of the, the sermon and the sentence, kind of where I want this kind of whole thing to go is that there may be a significant amount of ambiguity to, as to the timing of Jesus' return, but you can be certain of its significance. You can be certain of its significance. When we talk about end times, this is a, a branch of theology uh, that's called eschatology. It just means end times and the, the theology behind that. Uh, and there's many different variations on it and many different interpretations on it based on Scripture, some not so much based on Scripture. But um, it doesn't matter really where we fall on our interpretation of the end times. That's not really what I want to get into this morning because we don't have enough time. But what is most certain about it is the significance behind the importance of that day, the importance of when, when the end comes. Because what will happen, what we know in Scripture, is that one day the, cloud, the clouds will part, the sky will roll back, and our Savior Jesus will appear, and we will go to be with him one day. Amen? That's going to be a wonderful day. But here's the thing. So many times we hear verses and we hear sermons and different talks about this one thing. And we get fired up, most of us, about that. And if you're not saved, if you haven't come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, those those thoughts can cause a sense of fear to, like, get you motivated to come to Jesus, right? 
And, and that's great. And praise God for everybody who has come to know Jesus as a result of that. But there's this other side of the coin that I think we forget about most often. And that's what I want us to talk about today as we get into this. So if you've got a Bible, I want you to turn with me. Revelation 3 is where we're going to be starting off. Revelation 3.20 is really simply this. It's a section of Revelation where John is, is revealed these things. That's why it's called the book of Revelation. Um, is revealed these things. And it's these letters that are written to the churches. Okay, now, when we, when we read this, it's very easy to go, oh, so this is written to a church. This doesn't apply to me. This just applies to this individual church. However, I hate to burst your bubble, at the end of each one of those letters, there is this little phrase that's included, and it says, every man who has an ear, let him hear. Basically, hey, this is for everyone. This applies to everyone, not just these seven churches. This applies to everyone. So let me just, just pause for a minute and let you know, Yes, this applies to you. Yes, this applies to me. But this is what it says. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. That's Jesus talking. That's that's our Lord and Savior saying, look, I stand at the door and I knock. And I think of all the sermons, I think of Billy Graham and some of his sermons where people have used this verse and they talk about how Jesus is there to knock at the door and would you answer the call of Jesus? And praise God, like I said, for every single person who's ever accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior as a result of that verse. But I feel like sometimes we forget this one little fact, and that's this. Write this down. A time will come when the knocking will cease. The time is coming when the knocking that Jesus is doing on the door of of the hearts of all those around this world, that time will cease you know, when we, we read that verse, it said that Jesus would come in and, and have a meal with you. In, in the Greek, there's uh, three different ways that they would illustrate this, much like you and I have three different meals. Most of us have three different meals that we eat throughout the day. Um, they, they had a breakfast that was um, just really basic. I mean, most of us would be sadly disappointed if, if a first century meal um, it was set before us for breakfast. We were like, is this the appetizer? Nope, that's it. But there, there was breakfast, and it was, it was usually quick, very easy, out the door. There's lunch. It was something that was usually prepared that they could have picnic style, either on the side of the, the road or, or in the middle of their tasks for the day. And then there was the last meal, which is supper, which was meant to be something that was, was enjoyed, was savored, was, was just you took your time with this meal. And this idea that's used here is this, this idea that Jesus would come, would knock on the door, and those who answer, would, he would welcome, be welcomed in, and they would sit and linger and have this meal together. I think very often times when I read that, I think about our time around this table and how this table is meant to be a meal that we linger on each week. But Jesus gives this call, and he says, I will be the one that knocks on the door. I will be the one that, that comes to, to seek out those who are lost, and I will be the one that knocks on the door. Do you understand? Do you understand? There is no other worldview where the deity that is worshipped seeks the worshiper. Do, do you understand this? We read this last week with the, the, the prodigal son. Right before that was the, the prodigal of the lost sheep and the lost coin. No other worldview exists where the, the divine, divine person that is worshipped is the one that is seeking and knocking on the heart of those who are lost and without him. What an amazing gospel message that is. But one day, one day, this will cease. And when that happens, when that happens, the time for those to respond to the call of Christ will come to an end. And you and I will move into our time, into our celebration, into, our glory, into the glory that is promised us in, in so many passages of Scripture. And we will move into that. But there will be a vast number of individuals who will not have access to that. And the duty, the responsibility, the blessing falls on you and I as we prepare for that day to come. The blessing falls on us to be able to invite them in, to introduce them to that Savior, Jesus Christ. So this morning, I just want to really quickly, I want to give you three things, three prayers to prepare us for that end. Three prayers to prepare us as we go out of this place, as our sign says above our door out there, we're now going into the mission field. As we are prepared to leave here and to go into the world, what are some things that we could pray for? First thing is this, write this down. 
God, open a door. Everybody say this. God, open a door. Open a door. There you go. If you're online, you can say it in your living room. Um, God, open a door. We talked about this a little bit last week about looking at uh, the interruptions that we have well, two weeks ago. The interruptions that we have shouldn't be seen as interruptions. They should be seen as divine appointments where God has orchestrated a path to cross, where God has orchestrated somebody that you've uh, barely had contact with to, to bump into each other. I look at those opportunities all the time in my life, and I go, God, how can that be used to further your kingdom? Like, how in the world could, could those moments, those casual interactions with, with people that I know, how can that be used to further your kingdom? If we begin now, if you begin now, just to say, God, would you open a door? Would you open a door in my day for, for something to happen, some divine appointment to take place so that I can, can do the work of the kingdom? You know, this could be random. This could be just a complete stranger on the street. Uh, this could be somebody in your office or in your life, in your circle of influence that you know, that you know doesn't know Jesus, you know, kind of thing. And, and you just, you're just saying, you know, hey, God, I, I know this guy at my office. I, I know this lady in my office. She really needs you. God, would you just open a door? Would you just open a door for me to be able to, to talk about your son, Jesus? Could, could you just orchestrate this for me, right? But here's the thing. A lot of times, especially when it comes to the strangers, the people that are just random off the street, you know, that's where a door to open, we got to slow down, right? Amen? Can I get an amen to that? We got we to gotta slow down. How many of you guys are just, you feel like you're always in a rush? Anybody? Anybody in the room? I, I knew I, I had a, a rush mentality when my phone, I, I got this phone, and it, it will automatically sense when it's out of my pocket and, like, turn itself on, you know? Anybody have a phone like that where it'll just kind of, like, it knows when it's in your pocket so it doesn't turn on so you don't pocket call somebody. Um, but then when you pull it out, it automatically senses that and it turns on for you, right? As if hitting the power button was, like, some laborious task that I couldn't manage. But it does that anyways for me. I knew I had a problem with being rushed when my phone wouldn't turn on fast enough when I pulled it out of my pocket. Anybody with me on that? Like, I, it, it takes like a, literally like maybe a second, but when I pulled it out of my pocket, I would find myself hitting the power button, and which would then inadvertently turn it back off, and I'd have to turn it back on. Anybody with me on this? Uh, this is just me. Um, we have to slow down. We have to slow down. So many times, God is working these open door opportunities for us, but when we are too rushed through our day, when we are too rushed through the environments that we find ourselves, uh, you can just blow right past those opportunities. Just rush right past the open door and never, ever see it. So maybe a, a secondary prayer to this is God open a door and, and allow me to, maybe for the door swing to hit me in the face. So I slow down and I take notice of this open door. Uh, that, that would be a prayer I'd have for my life. The second one, the second prayer is God open their heart. God open their heart. Father, allow, you know, as the door opens for a conversation, Allow their heart to open and be yielding. Let it be soft, not, not a hardened heart that, that we've read about in Scripture so many times of different leaders and different individuals. But, Lord, Father, just let their heart be soft so that I can, can have a word and that they would be able to listen and perceive what it is that I'm saying. Father, open, open their heart. This could be uh, in, in the, the accidental place, you know, in the potential door of a random stranger, you know, just, just prick their heart, Father, so they would be willing to hear the message that, that we're trying to say. If it's somebody that you know, you know, you can be praying this on a, on a regular basis, you know, God, not just to my open door, but to any open door that any Christian has in that person's life. Father, help their heart to be soft, allow it to be molded by the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to go in and, and convict and reveal where there needs to be change, where there needs to be forgiveness of sin. But praying that prayer, you know, God, open a door. God, open their heart. That's just, that's just two-thirds of the equation. And, and a lot of times, most of us uh, find it really easy to do that. We can pray that prayer, those two prayers, really, really good. The last one is where it gets a little bit hard. So the last one is, God, open my mouth. God, open my mouth. Give me bravery. Give me strength. Give me courage to speak your truth, to say something in that moment. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand to this, but I would because I know I've done it. You've seen an open door. You feel like there's an open heart. And for the life of you, you just can't get your lips to separate. Like you just, you can't bring yourself to say something. And then you move on from that situation. And you're like the illustration at the very beginning. It wasn't a bus. It wasn't a plane. It was a missed opportunity. A missed opportunity for you to speak God's truth in that moment. 
let me, let me just say this. I know many of us, and, I, and maybe this will be helpful. I, too, have felt this, what I'm about to say. Many of us oftentimes feel a feeling of fear about what we're going to say in those moments, right? A lot of us, we just don't know what to say, right? Like, what do you say to somebody when they, when they have an open door and they have an open heart? What do you say to them in those moments? Um, how do you handle that? One of the things I've talked about before with you is, is this idea of knowing your story, right? Your story is, is, is personal. It's 100% accurate. Nobody can argue with you on your story, on how you came to know Jesus Christ. Like you are the leading expert of your salvation story, right? Nobody can argue with you. You can argue over dates and the history of, of the Bible and all these different things. But your story of salvation and coming to know Jesus cannot be argued with. So, a great place to start if you want to know what to say is know your story. Who were you before Jesus? How did you come to know Jesus? And who are you after having come to know Jesus? Those are three things, really easy. If you know that, most of the time, those are great opportunities just to segue into opening your mouth. On the flip side of that, many times I have felt that same feeling of fear of what do you say in those moments? How do you talk to somebody in those moments? When they have a question, oh my goodness, what if I don't know the answer to that question? Can I just say this, and, and maybe you've experienced this. I know other minister friends have experienced this. I know other people have experienced this. Um, often, very often, when you've prayed those prayers of God open the door, God open the heart, and God open my mouth, very often what I have found is that when I am committed and faithful in opening my mouth, God is committed and faithful to speaking through me. And there have been many conversations I've had with lost individuals. There's been many conversations I've had with individuals who are struggling with something. And I've just opened my mouth and I finish that conversation and I look back and I go, that was not from me. That was not from my wellspring of knowledge or, or, or understanding of the Bible. That was a truly divine moment where God spoke through me and said the words that needed to be said in that moment to that person. I don't know if any of you ever experienced it before, but afterwards you, you walk away going, wow, what a blessing. What, what an amazing God that, God that we serve that, that when I'm faithful in opening my mouth, he's faithful with opening the heart and he's faithful with opening a door and he's also faithful with speaking through those who will open their mouth. So I would just say, open your mouth. So um, when, we, when we do this, when we do this, you will see change happen in people's hearts. And I, I just got to say, it's not up to us to, to, to bring them to salvation every single time. A lot of people put this big expectation on, on their, their conversations that, like, if, I don't, if I'm not taking them to a baptistry somewhere and dunking them, like we've read about in the, in the New Testament and Acts and stuff about some of these guys, if I'm not doing that, well, then I haven't done the right thing and I've failed some way, right? Well, Paul is very clear. There are those who, who plant the seed and those who water it, and God is faithful God is faithful to bring that along. So whatever message you have for a person, when you do open your mouth, is another step that they could be taking on their faith journey. Just like you and I, when we come to know Christ, most of us didn't walk into one environment and went, yep, okay, I'm ready, let's go. Where do I sign? That's not how it works most of the time. Most of the time, it's a, it's a gradual process where we go from this idea of where we were before to who we are now. And even for most of us, it should still be continuing. We're not who we were yesterday. We, weren't who we, we aren't who we were last year. We're on a continual journey on this path. And so don't put this pressure on that conversation when you do open your mouth that uh, it has to be this, this like Billy Graham moment where, you, you know, thousands come to know Jesus as a result of your, your words, right? I wish. I wish that was the way it was, but that's not it. But here's the thing. This is what I want you to understand. What if this generation, what you and I are living in, this time that we're in, what if we could be more like a modern-day Elisha? Elisha was, if you remember your Old Testament uh, stories, uh, Elisha was the, the predecessor or the successor of, of Elijah. Now, I, I didn't name him. I didn't, I didn't do this, but just bear with me. Elijah, many of us know those stories and the amazing things that he did in the Old Testament as a prophet of the Lord. Um, and God told him towards the end of his life, he said, Elijah, I want you to go and appoint this man, Elisha, uh, one so I can confuse everybody that comes after, but appoint this man, Elisha, to be your successor. And so he does that. He goes and as a, as a signal of, of uh, designation, he places his cloak upon Elisha. 
uh, and Elisha becomes the next prophet for the Lord. And right in those final moments, right before uh, Elijah was taken up into heaven, uh, he turns to Elisha and he says, hey, what is it that you would want? Like, what's like a parting request of me before I go on to be with my God in heaven? And look at what Elisha says to this. Uh, in 2 Kings 2.9, he says, When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. And Elisha replied, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. Please let me inherit a double portion of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. This wasn't rooted in like what I can get out of this. It wasn't, it wasn't a selfish request as we've seen others do uh, throughout the pages of Scripture. This was a truly genuine request uh, from Elisha that he would have this double portion. And that's exactly what happened over the course of his life and his ministry of being a prophet. Some amazing things happened in his life, one of my favorite ones, if you, if you know the story uh, of Elisha, he's leaving a town and there's some boys that come and make fun of his bald head. And he sends him off curse. I just, I love that. So, so young men in the room, respect your elders. Don't, don't make fun of their bald head. Uh, otherwise, bad things could happen. He also revived a child who was dead by, by laying on them. That was really cool. Uh, the, the story of the never-ending bottles of oil uh, from, that, from that widow, that was great. There's so many great stories from Elisha. And then it's like at the end of his life, it just, it just kind of fizzles out and he's done. And there's just this one little verse and it's just in 2 Kings 13. And it just says, and then Elisha um, died and was buried. And that was it. That was all there was to it. But then this really amazing thing happens that I, I just think scripture skips over and glosses over. It says, groups of Moabite raiders used to invade the land each spring. Once when some Israelites were burying a man, they spied a band of these raiders. So they hastily just threw the corpse into the tomb of Elisha and fled. So they, they, there's, this, there's this group coming through and with, without any thought or reverence or anything for this poor guy that had just died, they're just like, oh, see ya, and throw him in a tomb and then they run off to protect themselves. Uh, it, what is phenomenal to me is this next verse it gets such little airtime in the, in the realm of, like, Scripture and stuff. Look what it says. But as soon as the body touched Elias' bones, the dead man revived and jumped to his feet. I mean, could you imagine being those raiders who just saw that happen where this guy was tossed in there and he was dead and then comes back to life? So let me just paint this picture for you. Elisha uh, is in the presence of Elijah and says, I want a double portion of the Holy Spirit that existed in your life. God granted him that. He did amazing wonders and, and signs to show people God's um, glory and, and just presence in the nation of Israel. And then upon his death, even in his death, his life continued to exude the presence of the Holy Spirit. So much so that a dead man brushed against the bones of Elisha and was brought back to life. Now, I don't want to make any grand conjecture or any inappropriate connections this morning. But I do want to say this. I know I, I don't expect us to have that kind of um, blessing on our life necessarily where people would come against our, our bones and they would come back to life. That's not where I'm going this morning. But let me just say this. There is a lost, dying, and dead world outside these doors. And what if, what if someone in this room, all of us in this room, we, we just had that prayer of God, you know, use me, allow a double portion of your blessing to exist in my life so that I can go and spread your word to the people around me. And what if, what if just from that prayer and from your dedication to praying those prayers, open the door, open their heart, open my mouth, people, dead people, lost people, when they come into your presence and they brush against you, whether it's at your work or whatever sport you play or, or in, in your school classes or online classes, whatever it looks like for you, grocery store, they come in contact with you, they brush against you, and because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and the dedication you have to open a door, to open a heart, and to open your mouth, they walk away alive. They walk away filled with life like that man did in that tomb. What if dead people lost people all around this world began to come back to life as a result of knowing you and knowing the existence 
of God in your life and what Jesus has done for you and what he's continuing to do for you right now, even amidst all this uncertainty that we face in this world? What if they come to life? What if they come in in your presence and they brush against you in the line at the store, getting gas, whatever it is, the, the coworker in the cubicle over, they come to contact with you and they walk away a changed person because of Jesus Christ that's living in you. Man, what an amazing story. What an amazing testimony that would be for this church. I tell you, as we come back, as we come back to things, as you come back in this room, online folks, as you come back in this room, let us not forget, gosh, let us not forget that we have a job to do, that there is a job for us to get done outside of these walls because we have to go and reach others. We have to go and reach the lost. Jesus says in Revelation 3, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. What happens when that knocking stops? Well, if you have used your time here on this earth wisely, would, you be, would it be said of you that you used the time here before that ends or before your last breath, that you used that time wisely, that you were a good steward of the days and the hours and the weeks and the minutes that you have on this earth? Or did we flaunt it away? Did we throw it away? Did we take it for granted? Because I'm telling you, we need to be about the Lord's work. One day that knocking will cease. I pray, my earnest prayer is that this church, you here, you online, that your life was lived in such a way that you gave it all for Jesus Christ. And that at the end of the days, when it's all said and done, you will arrive at the gate of heaven and you will hear your Lord and Savior say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the the privilege that it is for us to be in your house this morning. But Father, let us not forget that this isn't the, the, the culmination of our week. This is, this is just a pit stop to get us fired up and to get us re-energized and to get us more focused on living life with your son Jesus. And Father, your son Jesus, he, he is pursuing the lost. He is chasing down those who are apart from him. He is knocking on doors, on the hearts of doors, so many all around this world. And Father, it is our privilege and blessing to be a part of that journey for other people. Father, may we never forget that. I I don't want this just to be just a a sermon series we talk about being used by you right where we're at. Father, I want this to be the call of our heart that people all around this world are introduced to the, the face of love through this church. Through pe- People come to know Jesus through the faces in this room and those watching online. Father, let us be a good steward of our time that we have here. It tells us we're just a mist, we're just a vapor. Here one day and gone the next. Father, Father, may the legacy that we live now outlast any, any riches, any toys, any status symbol, any possession. May we chase hard after your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen. This morning, we're gonna stand and sing this song softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. And for most of us, we're, this is a song of praise and thanksgiving for that, that call that he had for us. But I want you to consider those who don't have this call yet, those who have not answered this call yet. Consider them. Think about them. I, I pray that right now as you sing this song, that a, a face and a name comes to the forefront of your mind right now. And that this week, you would be so bold as to pray those prayers. God, open a door. God, open their heart. And God, please open my mouth to speak your truth. If you're here today and you've never accepted Lord as your Savior, man, what, a, what better day to do that? Father's Day, come to the, the Almighty Father, our Heavenly Father. Come and fall in His arms and commit your life to Him. That's a, a great thing to do on today. If that's you, if you're watching online and that's you, if you're in the room, I'll be right back here. You can come see me. We want to do that right now, right in this place. 
if that's you and you're ready. For everybody else in the room, though, listen, we say this each week. I want you to consider your walk with Christ right now. I want you to consider where you're at, how you're doing. Where is he calling you? Where is he, where is he pushing you? What area of your life have you not surrendered yet that needs to be put back up on that altar? That's something we have to do each week, every single week, sometimes every day. Amen. <laughs> do that now. Do that now. While we stand and we sing this song, would you? Let's do that.